I just had a picture from um, Lily with a picture of cat food saying, thanks for the cat food, you idiot. <laughs> what? Uh, apparently she said, well, first of all, you bought some cat food because you thought it was crisps and I had to forcibly stop you from eating it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is good. This is, uh, this is all good stuff. <laughs> It's a totally different texture. What? Oh, like dry cat food. Oh, okay. I can yeah, now see. Been, I can called, see what drunk Dan was thinking now. It's called uh, Dre- Dreamies with tasty chicken. I think that is literally what we buy our cat at home. Hello, I'm Dan. I'm Simon. And this is the Wikicast, a podcast where Wikipedia takes us to a random article each week and we talk about what we find. Simon, what are we talking about this week? This week, Daniel, we are talking about, in our glorious return to form, the El Monte Berry Strike of 1933. Okay. Wait. Wait. Say all of that. What are we... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Again, once more, just just one more time. So the the name of the article this week is the El Bo- <laughs> I can't even say it with a straight face. The El Monte Berry Strike of 1933. Oh, for God's sake! So we should address the fact that this is we are back, much like Voldemort. We are after a, a two month hi or nearly two month hiatus because Dan yeah. has been doing his exams. You are now officially done with university. I know, it's really weird. Because that's we come back, you did all your exams, and so, you know, we have dragged him out of his uh hungover stupor. Um he was at a Buddhist temple. Um and uh that's that's why we're back recording. How did it all go, Dan? How how was the exam period? Look, to say it was a joy would be a lie. It was it, you know what, it all actually went it all went pretty well, I think. Um I performed pretty well in the exams, uh, dissertation, and all my other kind of coursework that I had to do at the same time. Um, it was as it was as good as I could have hoped it to have been. To be honest, I'm just enjoying the fact that I am now completely free. Mm. Um, it's a it's a nice it's a nice treat. I, I, we should also note that despite two months of hiatus and Simon and I speaking last week, being like, right, we, we're gonna you know we're gonna get back into the podcast. We're going to have a regular uh, red, regular kind of broadcasting schedule. Um, I received a message from Simon at two minutes past 10 this morning going, right, already then? And I was still very much in bed, very much hungover. So <laughs> you just the replied, fact this is even happening at all is incredible. You just replied with the word, P-ss. I thought it was later. Let me get out of bed. <laughs> like, it was just, the thing is, I've been, uh, with Pixel Girl and I, have been looking at going on holiday. And so we, we were looking up some stuff on, um, on like TripAdvisor and stuff. And I noticed it was 10 o'clock and she said, oh, hey, aren't you meant to be recording now? And I was like, Dan's definitely going to be late to this. Like, it's fine. I'm sure two minutes will be fine. <laughs> Lo and behold, I go over and message you and you're still in bed. So yeah, you've, had, you've had bigger fish to fry and, and we haven't really spoken that much actually over these past two months. We deliberately have kept it kind of, uh, we're, we're going to be catching up over the course of this podcast. So uh, you, dear readers, can uh, in- enjoy being part of this relationship, this special relationship that Dan and I has via uh, the podcast. <laughs> For sure. To, to to kick things off, shall I shall I tell you a bit more about this Wikipedia mm-hmm. article? We can go over what it's Please. been like recently uh, later on. So Please do. The El Monte Berry Strike began on June 1st, 1933 in El Monte, California. Mm-hmm. It was part of the largest California agricultural strike of 1933, organised by the Cannery and Agricultural Workers International Union, or Kawaii, uh, the berry strike affected local Japanese farm owners and growers. So it's a kind of a ludicrous title, but there is actually some mm. interesting things that went on here. Um, okay. So basically, it was in the middle of the Great Depression. Um, yeah. And a bunch of field workers and, and, and landowners who were having very difficult lives and the, the working conditions were very difficult. Um it eventually involved 7,000 workers. Um, and it says uh, the fact that there were twice as many jobs... Sorry, there were twice as many workers as there were jobs in the San Gabriel Valley caused the walkout, as well as bad conditions and low wages. So that's that's the scene. Okay. Um, now, the, the first subheading is connection to local alien land laws. So... <laughs> 
I just I, I I know that that's like the difficult term to refer to like immigrant like someone someone who is not from around the area is technically referred to as an alien um but it still kind of gives me a weird cognitive dissonance every time I see it um because basically this is like race was quite a big issue in here um and the fact that there was this land act in 1913 which dictated who could own land and placed heavy restrictions on immigrants being allowed to own land at all um, and there was a massive flux of Japanese immigrants from 1890 to 1920. Um, so there was mm-hmm. like, a, like a powder keg ready to go off in the berry picking industry. Um, Good Lord. New, hashtag new sentences. Um, what would you like to know, Dan? There's, there's, it's not a t- short article, actually. There's a fair bit going on here. Um, well, how how long is this article compared to our kind of the usual run-of-the-mill wikicast it's not. Articles. Uh, it's not um, Suleiman the Magnificent uh, in length, okay. but equally, it's not uh, a tiny county in the ass end of nowhere in America. <laughs> like it's it's a okay. reasonably sized article. How many points on the contents page does it have, and what are those? Uh, uh, background those subheadings. subheading. Okay. Connection to alien local alien landlords. Uh, course of. The, yeah, uh, yeah, not cause, but course of the strike. This was definitely not meant to be read out loud. Historical significance, references and further reading. Okay, can we have a bit of historical significance? Okay, so uh, Japanese-American farmers in El Monte essentially won the strike, but only because their interests overlapped with those of white landowners. Hashtag, this is America. Um, Furthermore, the defeat of the strikers was part of a larger anti-union campaign. The dismal outcome from the strike for agricultural workers resulted in the Kwayu being essentially extinguished by 1934. Japanese farmers would go on to play a similar middleman role in the Venice celery strike of 1936 and in the rise of the Nisei Farmers League in the 1970s. Wow. Wow. I'm sorry, I didn't realise that this play, this fe- fed into the legendary Venice celery strike of 1936. <laughs> this is this is a, a goldmine of historical significance happening, right? This is like that episode of Community where there's the um the pillows versus blankets and they have the Civil War documentary, <laughs> like the great the the battle of the uh, the water cooler and that kind, like that kind of thing. This is hilarious. It's, oh God, it it never ceases to amaze me how niche Wikipedia can get. Yeah, you know, like you 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 think of you think of it as being an incredibly useful, oversubscribed resource that is massively underfunded and no one really appreciates. Yeah, but then you also think, well, maybe I'm I'm giving it too much thought when you get articles like this, and you're just like, well, <laughs> it's just such a hive of nonsense. What gets me is the fact that like, it, I, when was this last edited? I bet it was to pr- surprisingly recent. No, this page was last edited on the twentieth of February, twenty seventeen. So. Like, somebody has gone through this with some editorial control, and you know how that you will have text, and within the text there'll be hyperlinks to things that the the editor thinks that you might want to know about, you know, or, or particularly relevant. Um, and in the little opening bit, the El Monte Berry Strike began on June 1st, 1933, in El Monte, California. El Monte, California has its own hyperlink, as you'd expect, uh, and so it shows you that it's in, like, pretty much the dead south of California. But also the mm-hmm. word strike is uh, hyperlinked, as is the word bury <laughs> later on in the paragraph. It's like, if at this point you don't know what berries are, like, oh, by the way, that's if, if you're an alien watching this, if you are affected by the local alien land laws, uh, you should probably have a look at that hyperlink. Um, as as is the Kaiu Kawiyu. Um, Oh, it was. That's interesting. See, there you go. You delve down one little bit and you get another interesting little thing. So the Kauai, the Cannery and Agricultural Workers International Union, was a communist-aligned union. Um, so oh, it, really? It, yeah. That is actually quite cool. But Because um, it says later on that basically wow. um, over the course of the strike, um, the Chamber of Commerce had a vested interest in keeping Mexican workers non-unionized and used tactics such as red baiting to turn a public opinion against the strikers. Um, so red baiting is a term I not heard before but to give the Wikipedia definition it's an informal logical fallacy that intends to discredit the validity of an opponent's logical argument by accusing, denouncing, attacking or persecuting an individual or group as communist, socialist, Marxist, Stalinist or anarchist, all sympathetic to those ideologies so something that we actually see kind of in the UK but not with um, 
communism, but it's kind of like as soon as anybody supports a, a hard Brexit supporting party, that in itself is kind of like a discrediting tactic rather than actually engaging with the policies. It's just like Brexit mm. baiting. And equally from the people who are on the Brexit side, people who are engaged in pro-Remain um, parties are like, oh, they're, but just, they're a Remainer. It's like Remain baiting. Um, that's interesting. So there we go. You, you from from the the great Berry Strike of nineteen thirty three. We actually find something vaguely interesting. Of course, there is like a yeah, an interesting thunk it. There is an interesting like race argument to this because like man, being Japanese in um, California in the thirties and forties must fucking suck. Not only I thought you, I thought you're just gonna I thought you're just gonna end it there. Man, <laughs> being Japanese, the end. <laughs> Stick that in the trailer. Yeah, that's going in the, that's going in the little. Um, the, the episode trailer for Wiki. Look, that we now do, of course, have a fanimation. We should um, Nina, Nina Beans, which will be on the Sponge and Electric page by the time that this episode oh, comes yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, did a the winner of the the fan the animation contest, contest um, which we which was funded by Fantastic. our Patreon. More news about Patreon later. Um, mm. And um, yeah, she did. A, she animated us a uh, Welsh dwarves section. Actually, it was like several Fantastic. several bits stitched together, and it was amazing. Yeah. A link in the show notes if you haven't seen this animation of us. Uh, it's great, and I wholeheartedly encourage Stella. people to do more of it. Um, Absolutely. So now, you know, we, you know, someone can animate me just going, "Huh, being Japanese, eh?" The thing is, Adam's not editing this one. I, I'm editing this one, so I, yeah. it, that is 100 percent not going to happen. <laughs> I feel I, we should all, we should be we should send him uh, our good wishes and good luck vibes because he still he, has exams. Yes, he is still doing exams, and of course, like the, it, it is the season for exams at the moment. It's GCSEs and A levels as well. I've been doing some streams on mm, Twitch. My uh, my younger brothers are, are going through their A levels as we speak. Oh, how are they finding it? Yeah, I think they're going all right. You know, it's as to be expected, I think, but they seem to be going quite well. Um, so, uh, wishing them good luck. In fact, I'm seeing I'm seeing one of them on uh, Wednesday. All oh, right. Are you going back? Because I'm going. To, I'm going. Well, I'm going to London. Oh, is this for the next part of the audition? No, this is for. Um, I'm going to see the milk carton kids again. Oh, you lucky bugger! I know, so that's quite exciting. So I'm going to go see that, and then I, I had uh, I'm going with a friend from down here, and uh, I'm treating my brother because it was his birthday uh, not long ago. So nice, oh fantastic, yeah. So and then I'm going to go home for a couple of days, and then back for Exeter for EGB, which I've never done. Oh, this, this kind is of the, the what, what is what is EGB, Dan? EGB EGB stands for Enchanted Garden Ball, I think, or or it could be Party. Isn't it? Um, e- in which case, it would be EGP. I thought it. I thought it was Exeter um, Garden Ball. Or is no, no, it, Enchanted. Because it it's this. It's like it's done. It's done in kind of rural Devon. Everyone gets a bus there and gets kind of p-ed in a field. Basically, it's the kind of the vibe sign it's, me it's, up. It's kind of it's kind of classic Exeter in that it's all very expensive and, and silly. I suppose it's kind of like the Exeter University equivalent of Mayball. Yeah. Um, but it, you know, it should be it should be quite good fun and, and, and jolly and things, and and it's also on the day of um, the UEFA Champions League final. Oh wow! So they've got it. They'll have it. They'll have a tent. But I'm not entirely sure whether I'll still be able to see it because if you want to be allowed access into this tent, you have to buy a secondary like tent access ticket. Oh come on! Um, and I was like, well, look, I've already shed out a you know an arm and a leg getting this this initial ticket anyway you know what i'll just stream it from my phone i'm not fast <laughs> um so uh so yeah but but liverpool are in the final so that should be quite exciting yeah which is I, the team i, I was speaking to um uh i, I can say this because the embargo has been lifted now so i i had an, a fun thing um where i went to a screening of a new bbc documentary uh series called the planets um right. and when i was there so basically it was in the what was the name of this? Uh, the Westfield. That was it. It was a, it was a, it was a shopping centre in London called the Westfield that had a cinema in it. Basically, the BBC rented out a cinema screen and they did a screening of um, <clears throat> one of the episodes in this series called The Planets, which is a Brian Cox documentary. Um, and the one that we watched was about Mars. Uh, but you know, it's about all of them and sort of the relationships between the planets and whatnot. And it's one of these like landmark series that they do every ten years or so, like the original Planet Earth was. Um, like it's it's meant to be pushing the boat out and like sort of pushing the limit of what BBC could do, and um, yeah, I was invited because I actually did a YouTube video uh, which is going out on BBC Earth, um, 
to as as like part of uh, so sort of associated with the series, um, which was mm. a really fun experience. I went up to Leicester and I I filmed at the National Space Centre, um, which was awesome. Uh, we were like there till quite late. We were the only people around, um, and basically that was why I was there. When I sat down to watch it, next to me was Brady Haran, um, who we met. Oh no way! Uh, uh, yeah, Vic yeah, yeah. And what amazed me was he saw me, pointed, waved, and then came and sat next to me, and I was like. What the? I, he does he think I'm yeah. I'm CGP Grey? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Um, I was very confused because I was sat next to Inace as it was. Um, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Our friend, and so I started talking to him, and he's a massive Liverpool fan. So I I I, oh, I, I said about the Champions League, and he was like, "To be honest, I'm just like cripplingly nervous more than anything else." Like, yeah. Liverpool are definitely yeah, going sure. into it as like the favourites, but all the same. It's like incredibly nerve wracking, especially when you're going up against. Especially, them. well, especially given the absolute kind of whitewash that was Barcelona, beating yeah. Barcelona four nil would lead you put to believe that that everything will be fine. But you know, sods law, something goes wrong, and they're just not on form, or you know. The thing is, Brady has this thing where every time he, um, every time Liverpool have been in an amazing situation, or to be fair, any time any of his sports teams have been in a situation like a Champions League final or a Super Bowl. Um, he's given up midway through and written it off as a lost cause or just outright missed it. And every time he's done that, his team have had the most miraculous turnarounds. Like Liverpool, when they won the Champions League in Istanbul, he Mm. was watching it and then kind of was like, well, this is over by like half time and just went to bed and then woke up in the morning and he'd missed the most incredible like night in the history of the sports club. Same thing happened with the um, Patriots when they had like this incredible turnaround in the Super Bowl. So he was like... I might just I might just not watch <laughs> just to yeah. like take the hit for the team <laughs> like because apparently if I don't we're guaranteed to win. But um yeah, he was um yeah, it was fun to catch up with him actually. It was um it was interesting talking to him cuz about how he does YouTube because he obviously has loads of different channels. Um and yeah. I assumed that he outsourced most of the editing like with I don't have time to edit the wiki cast anymore. So uh, you know, we get Adam to do mm. it and we pay we pay him to do it. Um but he actually basically does all of it. Like all, and he has like 12 different channels but does a video every couple of days um somewhere in that network but the stuff that he does isn't necessarily very editorially complex um it's just quite it was, i don't know it just it was quite surprising to talk to him about how he actually basically does, does everything himself still a single man made by a single man yeah it's uh, it's like Mine- minecraft 1010 the other day did you say that oh, no i didn't yeah, it's 10th birthday um and the ox cast are still playing i've been it. basically I've been basically dead to the world since uh, finishing my last exam. And by dead to the world, I mean reading books that I can read for fun uh, by a river <laughs> or on the Cathedral Green or something. You know? Yeah, I, I, you have earned the being uh, separate from the world. I mean, what has happened over the past like month or two that you might have missed? Uh, the EU elections um, happened. Oh, yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, that's a depressing thing. I've, I've, I went and seized my... I went and seized my not my my democrat my democratic right but my democratic duty exactly um to uh, and I've and voted the other day which is quite exciting what else has happened um yeah, Minecraft turned ten. That was a pretty big deal. <laughs> Jesus, yeah, wow. Uh, Eurovision happened. Did you what a did, did you watch Eurovision? Oh, for sure I did. Yeah, yeah. Because you you really like it, don't you? It's just hilarious, isn't it? I only the only reason I watch it is because Graham Norton is the most sarcastic like hilarious yeah. commentator uh, that's kind of the only reason I, I watched it really but James my housemate it was the first time he'd ever he'd ever seen Eurovision oh, so we, we did the whole we, we watched the whole hog and he he would just every couple of minutes he'd slowly kind of his head would pivot on his shoulders and he'd just look at me with this face of like what the hell is going on <laughs> um, it, yeah it was quite good it was quite jolly uh, Iceland though Jesus Christ I didn't watch any of it, so I have no idea. Oh, well, Iceland is the one that had this weird kind of like heavy metal screamo bondage thing. <laughs> it's just a bit like, oh, okay, <laughs> oh, go on then. Sounds like my kind of deal. Um, yeah. Wow, okay. I mean, well, I'm just trying to think. What, seriously, like the past month has been, I because I the past month I've been, um, uh, moved, like we've moved into the new house. I was done with all the traveling because I was away for ages, like doing filming, going to TwitchCon and things like that. Um, and I, I didn't have any time. So like since then, I've basically been just been eyes down editing and writing. Um, and yeah. there's several big projects that are on the go at the moment that I can't really talk about. But there is the next big science video that I've been working on. It's, an, it's half an hour long. I've been working on it for weeks and weeks. Um, and it's 
it's, it's just still it's it's like a, a Sisyphean task. It just seems to never end. There's always more work going on. Um, but gosh. yeah, it's uh, so I've been like kind of heads down and not really paying attention either. Like the stuff which I want to talk mm. about in Critics Corner. There's two things specifically that I I would like to um, okay. mention, but like, we, we don't want to don't want to blow our load too early, you know. Um, no, absolutely. One in five. Literally, yeah, one in five. Oh, Endgame came out. Did you see Avengers Endgame? That's like a, a big cultural I deal. I went and saw it on my. I went and saw it on my own. Oh, bless. <laughs> yeah, I just thought I'd treat myself to a little. And then it turns out that as I was walking out of the um, as I was walking out of the cinema, so did Michael Graham, who also went and saw it on his own. <laughs> that is you We're two in, the same show. in a nutshell. Yeah. <laughs> I sent him a message and was like, um, "Yeah, so uh, what did you think of Endgame?" He's like, "What the f- he's stalking me." He's like, "No, no, I was in the same showing. <laughs> I didn't realise, but yeah, it was. I thought it was very good." Wow. Well, we can, this this can be touched upon in uh, a critics, in critics again. corner. Yeah, because of course I went to see it with Danvey, uh, our glorious uh, ladman, um, who yes. accidentally bought us a couples uh, seat. So when we went, of course he did. When we went to the accidentally, cinema, yeah, yeah. Well, to be fair, and I could tell, I can hear his indignation from uh, several days and hundreds of miles away. Yeah. Um, basically, we walked into the cinema, which is a really cool old style Odeon um, on yeah. in Bristol that had been sort of upscaled and stuff. Um, and it was one of these places where a bit like a um, picture house where you could order food and pizza and stuff, but they would bring it to you in the cinema before the showing started. Ooh. It was very fancy. Right. But we came in and then all of the seats that were available, like every single one was a couple's one. Um, so <laughs> it wasn't just that he'd picked out these ones, but he didn't realise. But yeah. it was just funny. We turned up and like, I was like, what have Fair you enough. done? Um, and it was it was midnight showing. It was totally packed. And it was the best way I could have possibly seen that film. Uh, it, was, oh, it was amazing. I saw it quite a while after, I think I saw it. No, in fact, I think it was a couple of days after the midnight premiere because there was a big group of people who went to the midnight showing. Um, and... Uh, Dan being an old man I was just like I'm not, I'm not going to f***ing midnight I'd rather go to bed so I went to bed and saw it on my own a couple of days later did you get it spoiled um, or did or did you were you able to go in spoiler free no I, I was I was alright actually similarly with um with the Game of Thrones finale mm. um, I, uh, I I that the, the finale was I, I would have been able to watch it on the morning of my last exam so I, I my exam was 9.30 till 12.30 I went went to uni, did the exam, came home, made a cup of tea, watched the finale. So it's quite a, kind of like a nice treat. Yeah, I can um, imagine. But yeah, it was cool. Fantastic. I mean, okay, right. So before we move, uh, mm. what the next corner is Critics Corner, isn't it? We haven't. I, I, I'm not messing. Now, up. is it Critics Corner? or Is it my call? Oh, piece it of is. The week? Okay, well, so before we do call piece of the week, um, we should probably round out this article um, because yes. there's a few bits which we haven't touched upon yet. Um, there was there was a detail that I just picked out. Which was kind of horrifying. Uh, where was it? Hang on. Oh god, I'm gonna have to search for the, that word that I just saw. Yes, here we go. So perhaps uh, over to, to return back to this article, I will read you the section on the course of the strike because now we know that it's a thing and we know that it relates to the um, legendary Venice celery strike of 1936. Um, I should tell you what actually <laughs> happened. Um, so basically, um, strikers initially demanded a raise to the dizzying heights, this clearly unrealistic, communist-inspired dizzying heights of 25 cents per hour, um, which was promptly rejected, of course, by Japanese-American farmers. Um, The Japanese countered with an offer of 20 cents per hour, but that was also rejected by the strikers. Uh, To be fair, I have no concept for how much money that was at the time. Uh, but right. that doesn't seem like very much, to be fair. No. Um, with no, but then the problem is because they do have bargaining power here, the berry pickers. With no workers to pick fruit during the critical harvest season, Japanese farmers looked for support from organisations within the Japanese community to help pick berries. Children were excused mm. from school to help, while friends and relatives came from around Southern California to take in the harvest. Um, so California, literally, like. That is uh, like so twee and come on kids we're going to we're going to go pick berries in the feet uh, you know but like the background of that is if we don't pick berries hello to all our Californian listeners uh, <laughs> sorry <laughs> but the but the background is if we don't pick berries we're all gonna su- we're gonna starve and not survive the winter like yeah it's, it's just kind of horrifying but it's like come on get pick the kids up from school we're gonna go get in in so 
In Europe, the equivalent of that was the great potato blight in Ireland. And in California, it's picking up berries because they might... Oh, what are we going to do for our shakes? We won't have any milkshakes to go for. There'll be no ac- acacia berries. <laughs> oh, no. The great goji famine. <laughs> well, uh, yes. Amazing. Sorry. Hello to all the people from California. And also the other people in America yes. who like laughing at California. We're with you. Um... <laughs> uh, right okay so then uh, there's the sentence basically saying that they, the Chamber of Commerce had an in- a vested interest in keeping the Mexican workers non-unionized because it was the Mexicans who were striking uh, against that so just a, as a brief uh, as a brief aside that has to go on the list of hilariously dull um, sentences that are said while recording this podcast <laughs> the Chamber of Commerce were working very hard to keep the Mexican workers non-unionized uh, yes yeah, so, of course of course <laughs> <laughs> need to, need to be read. Read, like if, if there was like a if there was like a supercut of just weird things we say from reading these articles oh i would love that i would somebody please like someone on the discord if you have it's summer now you're gonna have plenty of time let's face it the readership of this podcast does not go outside in the summer most mostly i'm massively generalizing what i'm trying to say is you're gonna have time to edit together all the bizarre sentences that we've said someone go through all yeah. 59 episodes 50 this is actually our 60th episode but episode number 59 i realized yeah. so you know yeah because yeah, we had the uh, pilot yeah exactly mm. and we let him go eventually um so yes. the uh yeah the chamber of commerce had a vested interest in keeping mexican workers non-unionized and so they used red baiting against the mexicans so that to keep the japanese happy if we're all clear on that oh my god <laughs> uh, the month-long yeah. strike ended on july 6th 1933, with field workers declaring victory, even if they were no better off than they were before the strike, with a slight wage oh, increase. Berry season had come to an end when the strike was lifted, and so the berry farmers saw no need to make concessions. Fair there enough. we go. What a pointless... Like, they got a slight... All, all I can tell from this is a bunch of Japanese kids got off school for a bit. Um, the Mexicans yep. got a slight wage increase, which was probably due with inflation anyway. Um, and then it went on to... Uh, inspire well it certainly had a role in the venice celery strike of 1936 so there we go i'm glad we all we all learned about the el monte berry strike of 1933 it's it's great stuff guys welcome back to the wiki cast absolutely it's 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 all go 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 here and this will be my piece of the week drum roll please what dan is your choral piece of the week bear in mind of course that you, you haven't done this for a while there's like a two months worth of music you've been singing that you could pick from yes well it's actually quite poignant that i get to talk about my choral piece of the week because as of um about well after eucharist yesterday um exeter cathedral are on half term Ah, the Holy Festival of Half Term. So, uh, yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so it was the, I think the fifth Sunday after Easter yesterday, or the fourth. It was one of the Sundays after Easter. Um, uh, so now I get some time off, hence my being able to go to London. Um, but my choral piece of the week, he says, going through his recently added albums on Apple Music. <laughs> um, I'm going to go for. There's a uh, courtesy of. The one, the only Joe Reed, oh. uh, who is a choral music enthusiast and has absolutely outstanding taste. I was recommended an album featuring a new uh, group that I hadn't heard before. Um, it's called the Stormzy Consort. No, it's um, <laughs> the. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, the, wow, that was out of that, that was yeah, out of left field. Out of, out of nowhere. Um, the the group is called the Marion Consort. Um, and they're really, really good. Um, I'm, a, I'm a very big fan. Um, and at the end of this particular album, which is called Music for the Queen of Heaven, Contemporary Marian Motets, oh. um, uh, is uh, Ave Maristella by James Macmillan. Ah, I think I have it's heard really, this, It's actually. lovely. Yeah. Yeah, it's super nice. James Macmillan, Macmillan's a fantastic composer. Um, very, very atmospheric. Mm. Um, but he, he kind of, it, it kind of really shows you what can be done with kind of tasteful minimalist writing but very kind of choice harmony and it's it's very it's a lovely little uh, little ditty um but yes i can highly highly recommend that in fact everything on the album is fantastic so that's the the marion consort music for the queen of heaven contemporary marion motets 
Bish Bash Bosh. There'll be a link to the Spotify in the description so that you can have a listen. Spotify. Spotify. You went all the way Danny Dyer there. Listen to the Stormzy Consort on Spotify. Yeah. <laughs> Spotify. Now we find ourselves in in Critics Corner, which I think we've probably been both gagging to talk about uh, because there's been oh, yes. a huge amount Many of stuff things. that's been going on. So we already touched on um, Endgame. So yes. what is, given, I mean, this movie has now been out for a, a month. I actually can't remember how long it's been out. Um, I mean, the, the MCU... I think it's just a bit over a month. Okay. So the MCU has, has been brought to a close. What was mm. your take on the final the final chapter of it? I thought it was very tastefully done. They struck a really excellent balance, uh, kind of emotionally. Um, I thought they, the writing was incredible in in managing to kind of tie up all these loose ends and manage quite a convincing time travel. Spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's been out uh, yeah, for a while, guys. There's time travel in the movie. Okay. I think yeah, I think we're okay. Um, yeah, no, I thought it was really good, and I liked. Uh, it had some real human moments, which I think can often be kind of overlooked in in kind of superhero films um, because it's all so fantastic and showy. Um, there were the, there were there were kind of moments of real humanity um, that I thought were really really tasteful, particularly the ending with Captain America, um, the death of of Tony Stark. Uh, it, yeah, this section I, thought, I, I really enjoyed it. This section contains strong spoilers. Be be, yeah. <laughs> be aware. Um, yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I, I I thought it was great. I think what what was interesting about it was um, it's like it's not just a film. This is the final chapter of a twenty-two movie. It's an M and S Christmas <laughs> film. <laughs> this is Sorry, can't just can't myself there. This isn't just a Thanos snap. <laughs> this is an M and S Thanos snap. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's 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 the it's closing it's closing the book on uh, something that's really unprecedented in movie history. Like I know there are film series that have gone on for longer, like Godzilla has. I think Bond now has the same number of movies, but like you know there are film franchises with more films, but they are do, don't have continu- you know constant continuity. They don't have th- threads and arcs that go over those films. Like Tony Stark's arc really is the whole MCU, and you know it, Con- it, Tony it, Tony Stark Tony. St- Arc, exact, exactly. Sorry, uh, yeah. uh, sorry. Exactly. Zach. <laughs> I think I just had a stroke. Um, um, I mean, what was I, what was I trying to say before my brain just uh, misfired? <laughs> yeah, I was trying to say like the, the, uh, Tony Stark's. <laughs> 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 It's been a while, <laughs> but but most of all, he exact. Yeah, <laughs> he he fight, he snap, <laughs> but most of all, he exact. <laughs> he exact. <laughs> oh god, oh dear. I was trying to oh say dear. MCU movies good, um, and and like and, and they're different, it's, and and basically, Endgame is is wasn't remarkable for being a film. It was remarkable for being the way that it it rounded off that whole storyline the, the whole m the, the whole yeah. mcu um i actually thought as a film it wasn't as strong as infinity war and possibly that's because mm. i've been looking for infinity war a lot for this this move this next video project and i've been kind of drinking in just how good it is um mm. uh, you know and revisiting and you think wow they actually they balanced um you know they 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 balanced all the different character arcs and set things up for end game and reference stuff back in such like an efficient way and I think Endgame does that as well. And I think the time travel element does allow them to do the referencing really efficiently. Um, but it wasn't... As a standalone movie, I don't think it was as impressive. But as a cinematic event, I thought it was great. I, I, I thought it was mm. kind of unbeatable, really. I, I, it's not one of my favourite MCU movies. Um, I actually saw somebody who ranked... It was a friend of mine, um, Hugo, who, who ranked all of the MCU movies that he'd seen. And Endgame was actually qu- kind of... No, Endgame was one of the very top ones. And Infinity War was like somewhere down by the bottom, which I thought was quite surprising. Where does it stand in your overall rankings, do you think? Like, actually, what, what are your top... What, what would you say your top three MCU movies are? What were the ones you enjoyed the most? Well, I, I have a real soft spot for Doctor Strange. Yeah. I really, really liked Doctor Strange. That was kind of the one. I think the, 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 the kind of the superhero, the Avenger that um, that I kind of most connect with, basically because it's a bit magicy, um, which I quite like. 
Um, I think the Spider-Man movies are absolutely incredible. Yeah. Um, they are so well written, um, visually stunning, and have a really, again, humanity is at the heart of their storytelling, um, which is fantastic. I, God, look, I don't know. I think... I'm, I won't lie. I think the first Captain America film kind of was a bit is a bit under the ra- radar when compared to mm. the others. You know, I don't think I'll be able to choose a top three. As I say, Doctor Strange uh, is superb. Um, the Iron Man ones are pretty, you know, hard to go wrong. Uh, and the Spider Man ones, I think, would definitely be at the top. Yeah, I think I think Spider Man Homecoming would be up there for me. Um, yeah. Did you see the trailer incidentally for the new one with with Jake Gyllenhaal? Yeah, I did. I I, I don't know if it, I don't know if I'm going to enjoy it purely because like I feel like I'm kind of done with the MCU now. Like I know they have to. Yes. They're always going to keep making movies because they made so much money. But um, yeah, you know, I, there I, is a degree of catharsis in knowing that it's over. I think a lot of the reason why people enjoyed the Game of Thrones finale is because it, you know, like well that's the end of that now. Yeah. You know? I've finally I'm um, released from this this curse of wanting to know. Yeah, what the wheel next. the wheel has been broken, but it also hasn't been broken at all. Yeah, um, I mean yeah. we'll get onto Game of Thrones, I'm sure. But I mean, I, I was just, definitely. Yeah. I, was, I think I think Black Panther would have to be in my top three. I thought Black Panther was incredible. Oh yeah, I didn't even think of that. Yeah, that's a really um, good shout. Infinity War is probably one of my favorites, partly because I just I think it's awe inspiring how well written it is, like how efficiently they mm-hmm. they use t- um, time. Um, yeah, Spider- that's very true. Spider Man Homecoming is definitely up there. Um, I realised I basically just picked all the the most recent ones. I mean, like some of the old ones. I actually, what's been interesting was two things, as a, uh, which again gives information about this next video. Um, I went back and have been taking footage from all of the uh, the earlier MCU movies as well, and Thor looks way better and much more interesting than I remember it being. Like everybody kind of pans the original Thor, and it's like, oh yeah, we do, you don't need to worry about that because it's very, it's a very different Thor from basically everything else in the MCU. Um, and the yeah. ditto for Thor: The Dark World, which I finally watched for the first time, and now profoundly regret it because I, that's two hours I'm never going to get back. Um, but the, mm. the first Thor, if you actually look at it, it's really visually interesting. Like, yeah. I, I, well, I think it's it, it's part of of having that kind of a hero with that kind of a with that kind of a culture, a kind of visual culture. It's really different to, I mean, with the exception of Guardians of the Galaxy, pretty much everything is set mm. within with kind of Earth as as the kind of the binding of the narrative. Whereas yeah. um, Thor has this incredible, you know, like the 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 kind of the mythos and. Um, general yeah like the the, the 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 kind of the visual culture of of his background and his home world and it, it makes for a really interesting story yeah it's uh, i don't know so so yeah that was that was one thing um that i thought was interesting and i'd recommend people go back and watch a little bit of um uh like the original thor and just look out for dutch angles in particular F-ing every other shot in that movie is a dutch angle i swear to god um the other one yeah. was re-watching the original avengers Two things immediately jump out at you. Having watched like the tone of the MCU shift to the Russo brothers' style of doing things, um, first of all, you notice how campy it is by comparison. Like, if, if you actually watch it, the dialogue is a lot kind of cornier, a like a lot campier, and the design is a lot less kind of nitty gritty. If that makes sense, like look at Captain America's outfit, for example, it's the original one from the forties. Um, what's also f- amazing, and I don't think anybody noticed it at the time. It's shot in an aspect ratio that's like almost exactly 16 by 9. So yeah. all the other ones are like anamorphic and they've got letterboxing going on. But if we watch the Avengers and it's like, if you look at Blu-ray files, if you look at stuff on YouTube, clips directly from the movie, it's like, it's but it's it's not, but it's almost exactly 16 9. It's a really, it just mm. stands out like a sore thumb compared to all the other movies in the MCU in that it kind of looks like a TV yeah. show. Yeah. Like it's, I yeah, that's true. I haven't thought of that. Yeah, like, and, and and if you think, there's a couple of shots where it really jumps out at you. Like when Loki um, goes to the thing in Hamburg, I think it is, uh, and um, like takes the guy's eye and gets captured by Iron Man. Yeah, there's yeah. a shot of the the uh, event that he's gate crashing um, and sort of dispersing, and it's you realize just how like wide it is, like how vertically wide it is. Um, mm. It's um, yeah, it's it's. I, I recommend you yeah, get people have a look at the original Avengers and see what the aspect ratio is. 
says Simon in a talk that nobody else uh, cares about because it's just <laughs> geeky yeah. filmmaking stuff. Well, it's, it's, it's interesting to see, isn't it? Mm. So you're, you mentioned um, Game of Thrones. This is going to be like a whistle-stop tour for Critics Corner this time. Of just Here's, yeah. here's some shit that Simon and Dan engaged in. What did they think about it? Game of Thrones, season eight, go. What did you think? I th- Well, I think, you know, the, you know, as the series have gone on, the quality of writing has deteriorated. Um, yeah. I think the finale was really kind of unjustly whacked by by entitled fans thinking, oh, it didn't do what I wanted it to do, or you know, that's what they sound um, like. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I, I think they ended things as well as they could have done. George R. R. Martin's onto a winner anyway because he hasn't finished the final book. Therefore, he can judge the reaction of people <laughs> watching this film and then do the opposite. And therefore, he, he's written a better thing. I don't think know. he would do that. Um, though. I genuinely don't think. Because he said this in interviews about like he uh, criticizing the showrunners about how like they're just trying to subvert expectations, and yeah. you know he's saying if you just based on if you take what your audience is doing and re- and how it's reacting to your work and change the work, that's just going to totally wreck any arc that you have set up. Yeah, it's 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 not good writing, and I I just I'm so in yeah. agreement with him on that with this season. There were there were moments of kind of slightly too twee um moments in season eight i think they really really struggled with um pacing yeah. and 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 character arcs through that like daenerys's kind of uh descent into madness was was handled very clumsily yeah um and therefore you lost you stopped believing in her in you know episode three or four and which made naturally then the ending a little bit like oh okay that's a bit weird yeah um but you know i i still think it was for the vast majority of the criticism that finale the, f- the finale the uh the final <laughs> you're got. doing it too um, now <laughs> i know i know dear the finale um was a bit unjust i think you know they they did the best they did the best job they can with 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 what they kind of they made their bed and now they had to lie on it basically yeah um, um I mean, I feel like the the criticism that I have of the whole season is pacing. Like like you said, it's the fact that they have... Yes, yeah. I think that the end result is exactly where the story should have ended up with a f- maybe a few alterations. Um, yeah. But it should have taken place over two seasons, which are eight episodes long, not one season of six episodes. And like the, the showrunners rushed it out because they were wanted to be done with it and they wanted to move on and do an, n- new projects, which means writing the new Star Wars trilogy, which is fills yeah. fills me with hope. Wait, oh wait, no, the other thing. Um, and <laughs> like somebody put it really well, I can't remember who said this, that it reminds them of the prequels in that every other aspect of the show, the special effects in particular, mm-hmm. the music in the finale, I thought was great. The acting, the set design, the budget, you know, just the production of, of the whole thing was incredible. Like the best thing on TV, really. But the right, it was all in service of just abysmal writing. Like the, the dialogue, mm. let alone the pacing, the dialogue as well is just terrible. And the, the, the number of logical inconsistencies mm. within this season, like the constantly respawning Dothraki and Unsullied. Um, they just keep yes. popping out of holes in the ground. I won't, okay. Then it's kind of like they, 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 they started by trying to constantly subvert expectation and then there was such hype built around oh it's the biggest it's the largest filmed battle scene ever you know there was such an emphasis on visual spectacle that reality was lost mm. this won't look cool if we don't have thousands of people despite the fact that all of these thousands of people should be dead we'll just bring them all back like uh. it just makes you and then and and in doing so makes previous episodes and previous events seem trivial because you're like oh well you, you know there's, there's actually so many dothraki we don't doesn't matter or so many unsullied um oh i hate it i hate it dan yeah, i'm sorry it's, it's this is and i know that adam is like a massive defender of the season which is just as well he doesn't have to edit this podcast probably because he'd literally insert himself rebutting all of our points or just cut this whole section yeah. out but oh uh, i'm sorry for people that like it and i'm glad that you enjoyed the thing i'm not going to say you're wrong but i personally can't see how people can look past the failings of it uh and- yeah there are it, it is it is absolutely flawed um, I would still say, like, I thoroughly enjoyed watching season eight. There are moments of like, oh, that's really cool. Yeah, I really liked yeah. it. I liked the finale, um, the finale. The finale. Uh, it was already good, but it's. But you, I think you are, you're being unfair if you if you can't accept the fact that there are quite massive flaws in it. I mean, if it was a building, it would be the shard, in that it has yes. a f- load of flaws. 
And it's jagged as shit. Yeah, exactly. And cost a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> and probably, and will make a lot of money. Yeah. That was, um, I do... tell you what, I've been more excited to talk about <laughs> discounting Endgame and Game of Thrones. Good lord, what's left? Um, Sex? For those, for the, well, I know. Um, the, um, <laughs> the, uh, with the wow oh, sorry mind just wandering the, uh, the the world of Warcraft wow class oh my god Simon I'm so excited I'm, when I finish recording this podcast I'm going to download the beta uh, and and give it a play but what I have been watching and this is why it entitles me to talk about it in Critics Corner um, uh, Shin of the Yogg's cast has been doing uh, doing some live streams of him playing it mm. uh, and it is the most cathartic wonderful lovely because I mean, Shin's manner is quite kind of softly, softly catchy monkey, um, <laughs> but it's just so like, oh god, I love it. He was doing it. I was watching yesterday when I was walking to Pre's, and I had my I had my AirPods in, so I couldn't obviously couldn't hear anybody who was talking to me. Um, but I was just watching him do the kind of the last twenty five minute run on classic Dead Minds, and it was the like this is one of the first. Um, like dungeons that's available for you to do bearing in mind in the classic game you have to find you know you've got to spam general or trade chat to find to get a group together you've got to run to the place you've got there's no map um and it was just i I had the most glorious kind of wave of nostalgia and like oh i remember this and it was really really lovely um so i'm yeah that was really really nice (laughs) i mean i I, as soon as i saw that it was a thing i immediately thought of you I was like, that Dan yeah. is going to be all yeah. over this. <laughs> it's so exciting because it is. It's it's effectively the the untouched game from two thousand and four, and it's just su- you get such well like waves of you can you can even change you know you can change settings such that you can scale the water physics back to what it was in the original game. Um, wow! And, oh god, it's just so. Amazing. So, what is the appeal so, of this? Is, so is it just nostalgia, or is there actually new content for this, or is it just the game as it was, but with better graphics? It's the game as it was. It's the game as it was. Um, they've had to make some changes, obviously, but it's a it's a testament to how they've done it that you can go and look up the old like one point twelve patch notes, and and it's pretty much the same. You know, it's it's a it's a it is a really different game, for mm. sure. And I think what I like about it is that you just get the people who definitely people will go back and, and and those who didn't play the first game or did play the first game and think they remember what it was like will play it and be like, this is really stupid and hard and way too tedious. I'm not going to play that, which means the kind of the player base of classic, I think, will be a slightly more mature understanding yeah. player, player, player base that want to kind of enjoy the classic game and get into the RP aspects of it and that's what I think is most exciting. You know, like you come across somebody leveling and you group up and you have a chat and you kind of like have all these throwbacks. So like, oh, remember when we, you know, I've been here for two hours because this particular Murloc isn't dropping an eye or something, you know, like, <laughs> but that's actually quite nice. That that kind of the, the grind, because it used to be so grindy. Like you would literally, you could be playing for a couple of hours to get, finally wait for, for a number of, you know, seven asses of bear and you need to kill, you end up killing about 200 of them because for whatever reason, <laughs> they're just not dropping these these asses. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's super cool. Just the same image of you hacking away at poor bears in the forest, being, drop your f***ing asses! <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see the ass there. It's like it's not like you kill it and it was, oh, I've, ac- I've accidentally killed an arseless bear. It's a little bit, it's just, you know. It's, anyway, it's, it's super cool. So I'm going to download that later. And uh, If it works out, if, if we can work something out, it would be fun to maybe do like a bit of stuff for Spongy and Electric where, with us two. I playing. cannot tell you how much I want that to happen. That would be amazing. I don't mean amazing. To, I don't mean to interrupt you and discredit what, everything you're saying, but I can confirm that the next door neighbor's dog has noticed me recording this podcast and is looking right at me. And oh I love him, and I think I would die for him. He's Barney. <laughs> he's called Barney. He's a six-month-old golden lab, and I oh love him. And he's literally looking at me out the window. It's like the episode of It's Always Sunny where they see each other across the room. We're just we're just staring at yeah. each other right now. Yeah, have I? Hello. That's beautiful. He's looking back at me. Hello. Oh my god, I love him. I love him, Dan. I'm reviewing the next door neighbor's dog, and it's that he's wonderful. Anyway, well, Critics Corner. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, it's Critics Corner. I do have two other things that I'd like to bring up. 
um, okay. which, uh, in Critics Corner, but just briefly. Uh, one is a TV show and one is music. Um, briefly, uh, Pixel Girl and I went to a concert in Cambridge uh, this month. Uh, we went to see Tenebrae uh, performing oh, yes. uh, the Victoria Requiem uh, and a few other bits of the Spanish Renaissance. And it was amazing. Um, I Because you, you saw Tenebrae in Exeter, right, when they did The Path of Miracles. Yes. I yeah. Did. And like it's it definitely wasn't at that level because it was the piece wasn't as special. Um and also mm. in not being in English, it's when when they're in when they're singing in English, you realize how great their diction is. Um but yeah. it was just it's I think cuz it was what two I think there was 16. I think there was, so there were 16 of them somewhat confusingly for branding. Um and it was it just filled King's it was it was in King's College Chapel. Um it just filled the space. It was in, uh, a, yeah. an amazing experience. And that their mega second bass, whose name I've forgotten, is exactly as he was in that first concert. Dear readers, if you've never been to a classical music concert with a professional choir, and especially, like, you, you will... If you listen to recordings of choirs, you will kind of get a sense of, you can hear the different voice parts, and sometimes there'll be a voice part that really sticks out. Normally, you don't really want that, but when it comes to certain pieces of music, sometimes you do want... Um, a very strong bass line like the second bass stuff can because it's the foundation of the chords can be really important and Tenebrae have quite possibly the best choral bass in the world um, and if you listen to any of the recordings that they have if you listen to the path of, or, or, or yeah if you listen to for example their recording of the Victoria Requiem which I'll link in the description um, you can hear him so clearly and it's you think to yourself, oh, because maybe I can just hear it because of my headphones, like it's preferring bass or whatever. No, if you listen to them live, even in a massive building, he is totally audible. And it is, and when it's the really low stuff that goes down to bottom Ds and stuff like that, it is. It, it, I feel like I'm a puppy. I'm like Barney over there being tickled. Like I'm on the floor being tickled. Uh, my tummy being tickled. It, it just has an effect mm. on me. Um, so that was great. And I'd highly recommend people listen to their recording of the Victoria um, Requiem because it did win them an award, I think. I think it won them a Grammy or something. Anyway, it won them something. Mm. The other thing that I want to uh, touch on is another TV show that I've started watching now that we've finished watching Game of Thrones, but we had an LTV t- uh, subscription, is Chernobyl. Now, have you watched any of this? No. So Chernobyl is um, a documentary series. Well, no, it's a it's a dramatization of real events. If 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 that makes sense, um, right? Okay. Ab- about the Chernobyl nuclear disaster, disaster, and the first episode opens with the moment that the explosion happens, and the six episodes at the moment at the time of recording, three are released. Um, they're an hour each, and it goes into the um, immediate response to the disaster, and then basically the effort to contain all of the radiation and the nuclear waste from leaving the power plant. And it is one of the best TV shows I've ever watched. Um, oh, cool. It is shot like a horror film, but the the monster is radiation, which because it's totally invisible and it's you know there's no, it, it's a totally realistic take on events. Um, there's no kind of mm. outlandish CGI or anything. Everything is exactly as it would have looked. And when you actually in the first episode, when you have the accident happening and you see the um like one of the characters just is told to see if the reactor is still there and w- walks over and sees with his own like naked eyes the the heart of a nuclear reactor burning at thousands of degrees and mm-hmm. turns away and after seconds of exposure has blistering sunburns all over all over his face from the radiation and within and later on it's not a spoiler to say he, he he's dead from the radiation within a matter of days but like his face has just disappeared like the the way that they depict radiation um burns and the and the acute radiation um sickness is horrifying like the, the prosthetics team just knocked it out of the park i've never seen prosthetics like these before it is one of the scariest, most horrifying things I've ever seen. And I'm encouraging everyone to watch it if you can. It's on Now TV. I think it's also on Sky. Um, and it's on HBO in America, I think. But it is totally mm. worth your time. Okay. It, it, I re- and I like I'll give it a watch. Production value wise, it's amazing. It's just. And, and Stellan Skarsgård is one of the um, key guys in it, as is, if people watch The Expanse, the. 
Oh god, I can't remember the character's name. The guy's the head of the terrorist organ, uh, the head of the EPA, um, is a key character in this as well. Uh, uh, yeah, all, all round phenomenal show. Highly, highly recommended. <laughs> Oh no, the the hangover crashes here. Yeah, you should it's, have eaten. It's really real. You should have eaten some of that cat food, man. So we find ourselves in Patreon Corner. It took Simon and I just a, a hot second to remember what this segment even is because it's been such a long time. <laughs> Cast your mind backs, my mind backs. Oh god. Cast your mind back. The hangover uh, has hit, ladies and, and gentlemen. The oh, hangover really, has hit. It's really intense. It's really intense. Um. Cast your mind back, and, and you'll remember that um, we kind of sh- we kind of changed how we were doing um, this this kind of Patreon management and the pledges and things. Uh, so what we're going to do is I am going to read out our top dogs, and Simon is going to read out our top cats. Uh, this is just a moment to kind of say a massive thank you to those who support us, um, and we'll be able to have a new uh, a new tally of who is ahead in terms of the the most premium animal. Um, we should also say a, a congratulations uh, to Nina McBeena for for winning our uh, our animation contest. Uh, that uh, that money is, is is wending wending its way to her as we speak. Um, <laughs> Jesus Christ! He leaves university what? and all of his language just falls out of his ass. Like you, tr- I'm trying my best. <laughs> You're like a wow thing, but I- instead of dropping an ass, you just dropped all cognitive ability. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, I'm really, really hungover. Okay, give me, give me, give me some credit. Anyway, she won this animation contest we did, and it's funded by our patrons. Hooray! I'd like to say a thank you to our top dog Ben McMurtry. <laughs> oh, do you want to do? Should we do all the top dogs? I'll do. You do all the top dogs, and I'll do all the top cats. How about that? Okay, I'm going to do all the top dogs in one breath. <gasps> I'd like to say thank you to Ben McMurtry, Alec, er, oh, <laughs> sake, Eric Bolli- Bollinger. Uh, I've, I read that as Bollinger because I like Bolly. Um, Jay Wright, Carl Much, Maggie, Marut, Vakira Punyawat, Nina Colton, Peter Reed, Rory Healy, and Sentient Baguette. Oh, amazing. I, I, I had to, like, I... I... <laughs> I, I was about I was about to um, decry all of those people as, as filthy traitors, but um, I'm not mm. a UK politician uh, or, or a UK newspaper, so I'm not going to do so because that is not a helpful discourse. Right. Um, so I would like to thank all of the top cats of the podcast. Um, I'd like to thank... Ch- <gasps> okay, right. Hang on. <sighs> I'm going to... Uh... <sighs> I'd like to thank Chuck Cat, Carl Mansfield, Devon Hill, Hans J, Hartman Dat, Isabel Ostrowski, Codzo, Lachlan Woods, Leila Medina, Lewis Watson, Oliver Burkhart, Oliver Craigie, Omar Miranda, Princess Andromeda, Rents Kirk, River Ward, Tapio Kirkinen, and William Humphreys. Oh my god. I did it! Well done. That was a lot. Well done. And I think I have uh by my tally, Dan, there are 18 top cats. How many uh how many top dogs do you have over there? We have we have ten. Oh dear. There's been a change. There's been a disturbance in the forks. I have felt it. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I say on that's 18 top cats and 23 members of Team Cat in the the one dollar tier. So for those of you who are new to the podcast, if for some reason you were like, ah, oh, this podcast hasn't uploaded in ages and there's suddenly a new episode, I'll give it a go. Um, you you support us on Patreon to keep the the lights on to fund things like the Wikicast Animation Contest, and you can do so with uh, one dollar a month, which is the Team Cat or Team Dog tier, or the Top Cat or Top Dog tier, which is five dollars a month, and we will thank you in every episode. Yeah. Uh, so there are twenty three members of Team Cat and eighteen Top Cats. And we have 10 top dogs and interesting, interestingly, uh, 23 team dogs as well. So 10 so plus team 23. dogs and team cats are tied. However, top cats are, are trumping top dogs by eight points. I have said this from the very beginning of this podcast that I think all the people who would be supporting Team Cat are just so generous that they wanted to give us more money by being top lads. So I, 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 I feel vindicated by this. And yeah. if you want to prove me wrong, and if you'd like to support the, the podcast, and you think that the, the, the humble dog is the man's best friend, I'm looking again at Barney. And Absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm lost in his eyes right now. He is, he's such a beautiful boy. No, no, I will not be tempted. Um, but, then you, but if you want to be tempted by Barney's eyes, um, then you can do so. And you can uh, pledge us at patreon.com forward slash the wiki cast. And it keeps the show mm-hmm. on the air. Really? 
We don't have we, we don't have ads. This is the only way that this show keeps going. Uh, and uh, you are the you are the water wings for this podcast. Without you, we would sink. <laughs> Dan and I are two little toddlers <laughs> desperately paddling, <Yeah. laughs> literally doggy paddling. And yes, we want we want some kind of edit of two to- two toddlers in a swimming pool uh, with the faces of Simon and myself. And the Patreon is just Wikicast Patreon is like a, a, a partly transparent layer over the water. <laughs> It's keeping us afloat. Oh, boy. We should move on, Dan. <laughs> Top lad. And we now find ourselves in Crisis Corner. We, we think we've navigated the, the Spongy and Electric Treehouse uh, to find the right room. It's been a while since we've, 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 <laughs> we've had to do this. But we think it's Crisis mm. Corner next. Um, and we do have a crisis. For those of you who are new to the show, or need a refresher because heavens knows... We do. Um, this is the section of the show where people can um, write into us and we will anonymize all correspondence that's sent to spongyelectric at gmail.com uh, with Crisis Corner in the subject line. Um, and uh, we will read out this crisis and we will invite you, dear readers, to respond with your thoughts on the crisis. And of Dan, um, you were going to read out the crisis this week from, let me get this right, uh, Anonymous. Um, and I will, yes. I will give my thoughts and then we'll turn it over to our readers to, to get back to us as well. So over to you, Dan. Fabulous. Here we go. So from Anonymous. Dear Dan and Simon, I'm just going with alphabetical order here. I've had this recurring crisis for a very long time now, ever since I started going to school, in fact. I just can't find a solution to it. I'm an honest person. I value honesty and integrity above all else. And because of that, I despise academic misconducts. However, no one in my life seems to share that view. They all think that because someone else is cheating... um, Uh, doesn't directly affect them. Uh, They shouldn't care at all. This is definitely not true if the course was graded on a curve. Worse, I've got the, we're not going to use this in real life anyway. Opening this kind of worms will lead me down a really, really deep rabbit hole, but feel free to discuss it in the podcast if time permits. Uh, Or that I'm just on a moral high horse. But to me, cheating is wrong. And if they're willing to cheat in exams, it means they are more concerned with doing the easy thing rather than the right thing. How am I to know that the next time they opt for the easy way rather than the right way, it won't be with me. And for this reason, I've had a very hard time seeing people who cheat as good or even trustworthy individuals. However, all the people in my life seem to think I'm crazy in thinking this. By all, I truly mean all, with the exception of my therapist. (laughs) Uh, They think I'm overly critical or just uh, outright judgmental. And all I'm doing is setting myself up for a a life of misery. Um, I've also been told that I'm a source of negativity because of my view on academic misconducts. If I keep having this opinion, I'll always be alone, long story short. Uh, and due to many reasons, including cultural isolation, I've never had many friends, but the relationships sometimes seem very fragile. I'm really sorry if this all seems like a long ramble, but I really don't know what to do. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. Anonymous. <laughs> amazing, amazing send-off on the email there. Okay, Anonymous, I want to be very clear about something. If you think that cheating is bad, you're not f- crazy right yeah cheating is bad uh, academically um i don't know where uh, anonymous is from i know that in certain cultures um and in particular like it's been in the headlines recently um it's uh, asian students at uk and us universities um have been like there have been rings of cheating that have been exposed i'm sure that there are other cultures that do it too that's just the one that's been most recent um yeah. you know it is a culturally more acceptable thing i think in in some cultures than others to just cheat academically and it's the end result it's getting the grade that counts rather than the process of learning what you are doing mm. is quite correctly viewing the process of learning and the knowledge that is actually acquired and well more more than the knowledge is the thought processes that are acquired um through an education you're viewing those as being more important than the end result people who do not think that way are short-sighted and will not achieve a great amount of success in life because that's people don't judge you based on solely on the way that you conduct sorry that, that you achieve a project right if you are at work and the sole thing that you care about is how many customers you get through the door, then by your standards, if you get 200 people through the door on a given day, it's a success. If, however, you did that by lying to people, by coercing them, by intimidating them, then that will affect how people view you and view your business. To give you sort of like a, a more abstract kind of example, the end does not always justify the means. And that's like a very dangerous way of thinking to to believe otherwise so i i just i just i feel like you you feel like you're alone and that you're just going crazy and that you know am i am i in the, in the wrong here because i think that you know education should be fair and as, as you say if it's graded on a curve like it should be fair to everyone you're not crazy 
I, I just, I can't, I, if anyone has an interesting, because I don't actually have any interesting cheating stories. I don't know of anybody who academically cheated as part of their, you know, at school or at university. Um, I would be mm. really interested if members of the community uh, would like to anonymously, I'd like to stress, anonymously contribute, whether they cheated perhaps, or if somebody they knew cheated, um, mm. what that experience was like. Dan, do you have anything to, to, to chime in on that? No, well, I've, uh, certainly at university, I've uh, cheating is kind of, you can't really facilitate it in maybe that's because I'm doing a humanities degree. I don't know, but mm. certainly like in an exam situation, if you don't know stuff and the only thing, the only way I can see you cheating is like if someone else goes and sits your exam, but there are, that's so hard to do because they do all these identity checks. Mm. Um, and every essay or piece of work that you've got to turn in has to go through now also turn it in and they do all these plagiarism checks and stuff. So yeah, no, I don't have anything, but I'd be really curious to hear um, hear what other people think. Absolutely. I mean, uh, yeah, uh, you're not crazy, Anonymous. You're not crazy. Don't yeah. you? I feel like I'm gripping you by the shoulders and shouting at you. You're not crazy! Yes. <laughs> oh, Barney, sorry. He just Sometimes when I'm very, very loud, Barney looks up at me from their window. Sorry, Barney. Um, <laughs> I didn't mean, to, I didn't mean to, to hurt you. I didn't mean to make you cry. All right. So Dan and I um, are going to do now some correspondence of yours. Oh, Barney's got a chew toy. I'm so, I keep talking about Barney, but I would die for that dog. I'm not exaggerating. Oh, um, bless him. Um, uh, basically, um, we have a lot of correspondence because we've been on F off air for a while. And um, you guys have been incredibly active whilst we've been away and like sending us emails and stuff. Mm. Um, and Dan is very, very hungover. <laughs> yeah, we, we look. Things started. Things started super well, um, and now we're just like we're deteriorating really quite. He's treading at a, at a water. Rate. The the the, the yeah. little water wings are deflating. He's going under. Um, so should, should should we pick maybe three items of correspondence? But we will be back next week. We'd like to point out. So you yes. know that the, the break is over. You won't have to wait for so long. So we will go through these emails um, or the ones that you know aren't just dick pics. Um, and um, yeah, the back catalogue of of, of, of uh, many there's, dick pics. There's so much. Um, some of you guys there's are, so are really like d depressingly large. Um, uh, so let's do three emails. Shall we? Let's limit ourselves to three okay. emails, and then we will. Help go through more of these in coming weeks. All right, guys, don't worry. We're not being okay. ungrateful bastards. We're just being realistic about Dan's cognitive abilities. Because I, I, I think I'm going to lose the power of speech in about 15 minutes. So. Sure. Right. Well, what's your first email, Dan? Pick, pick one. Well, my first my first email is from uh, Joanna Buchanan. Um, Joanna says, "Dear Messrs. Clark and Moore, I must begin by stating that I, I am Team Dog all the way. A very good choice. Mm. However, I'm." Um, However much I adore cats and all animals, to be honest, I'm obliged to side with Dan on this debate. I very much enjoy listen to the, listening to the Whis Wikicast, especially before I make my futile attempts to sleep or complete homework that I should have done two weeks ago and have run out with creative excuses for why I don't have said homework, saving only um, for English or French since I enjoy those subjects and actually make some kind of effort, meaning I get A-star grades and my parents' evening reports were glowing, insert smug hair flip here. <laughs> As I live very close to Bath Uni, I have very fond memories of throwing excessive amounts of bread to grateful but probably fattening ducks. By the way, I was so disappointed to in Simon to hear that A, he's a veg he's a he's veganariable and B <laughs> Wait, what? I'm, I mean, veg, veginariable. I think I think she means that I'm either vegetarian or not technically vegetarian because I do eat fish from time to time. So I think that's what okay. She means and there. B, a cat person. <laughs> Sincerely, a tiny person with extremely foul mouth. P.S. Will Simon be returning to Scout Camp 2019? It's predicted to be a banging week. Mark's words. <laughs> okay. I thought. I, yes, I thought this was you, Joanna. So Joanna was the girl who uh, was on Scout Camp. I helped because I helped out with um, the Scout Camp that uh, was my Scout troop when I was a kid um, uh, last summer. It was and it was a great time. Joanna was um, on that camp and was a tiny person with a foul mouth that was how i described her she was also had an incredible proclivity for knives like we kept having to take knives knives off of her at various times during the week and like going after people was like no joanna come here G give, give me that i know you've got more than one 
Like, it was a very interesting being around her. I don't know if I'm going to be back. If I can, I will be. Um, I haven't, I do, no, I haven't sent an email, actually. I will I will do my best to to be there because I had such a great time last year. I would love to come back on, on summer camp. And uh, I will confiscate knives from you all day, Joanna, if it makes you happy. So <laughs> I didn't realize you were a reader. Thank you. Have you, actually, that's a point. Have you had um, people that you didn't realize listen to the show um, just mention it to you? Like, we've never had correspondence. Yeah. Like who who yeah, who's, who surprised you by saying that they listened to the show? It was somebody I met through. That's obviously you get the people who come up to you in a club or something and say, "Oh, by the way, I love the podcast." You go, "Oh, that's nice." But then there was somebody on my course who was in one of my seminars who listens to it. Oh right! I'm doing them an injustice by not remembering their name, but they're like, "Oh, by the way, the podcast's really good." I also walked into a back when I had to study, <laughs> not anymore. Um, I was walking into one of the study centres, and there was a sticker on the back of somebody's laptop. This was in a- the Amory Building uh, mm-hmm. of X University. So, if you are that person, um, much much respecto to you. I actually that, well, there's two things because one one uh, firstly, <clears throat> uh, there was a friend of mine who I'm in a. Uh, group chat with on WhatsApp, um, with the Warhammer group chat. Uh, he was one of the guys I went to Warhammer World with. And um, he just Nerd. offhandedly what? dropped in the conversation that he really likes Bungie and Electric. And I was like, what, you've never yeah. met, you've never emailed in. But like, it was just a bizarre like thing that he listens to us and it's like, it's a friend. That's so strange. It, because then it's not a, a one-way relationship. Like you do actually know this person, but you treat them as if you don't know them via this product. But obviously it's totally impractical for us to say, hello, Hugo, uh, Joanna, Marty, John, Mar- like all the people that you know, like as if you have like a little side section for all the people that you know. Yeah, um, yeah. But um, and, yeah, so I'd like to declare, because Marty uh, hasn't uh, emailed in anything, I'd just like to declare that the uh, Imperial Fists is the favorite legion of the uh, the Wikicast, and by extension, its entire readership, um, and that the Iron Warriors are massively overrated, and um, I would invite correspondents to uh, co- challenge the title of, of the uh, favorite legion uh, from the Iron, uh, sorry, from the Imperial Fists. So there we go. That's a reference that like five people will get. The other thing which I wanted to briefly say on that note was I finally met Pyrian Flax um, at TwitchCon. And um, I dropped in that, uh, like, we because we, we chatted for a bit and he asked me about my PhD and stuff because Terps, Terps' way of introducing me to a group was, oh, this is Simon. He's got a PhD. Like, because yeah. that isn't enough of a meme. Uh, so Imperium just immediately was like, oh, what's your PhD? And then like started talking about it. And then, like, you know, the conversation came to a natural lull. And I just leaned in and I was like, by the way, I uh, have a tiny penis. <laughs> like, which for those of you who don't know, that is how you announce, that's how you like say that you listen to the, his podcast, the Triforce podcast. Um, but like, I just, in the middle of all these people that I didn't know, just leaned in and was like, I have a tiny penis. And he just looked at me and nodded and was like, nice. Um, so I've now been in that situation where like, I've been like, kind of know somebody and then dropped in. Oh yeah, I listen to your podcast. I think it's really cool. Um, so yeah. I, I know the feel, guys. Um, sorry, so do, do you want to... Do you pick, I've talked for ages, Dan. Do you, do you want to pick another email? Why not? Let's see. I'm going to go for... We've got an email here from Tommy K. <laughs> uh, Tommy K's subtitle is They're Great. <laughs> Messrs. Clark and more. Just listened to, read, the first four or five episodes of the Wikicast and have to say you should rename the podcast Dave as it surely is the home of witty banter. <laughs> uh, it's helped me to trawl through a few weeks of missed lectures. I'm doing physics at the University of Manchester Ooh. and now procrastinate, um, and now to procrastinate doing any more. Your, your unique, your, oh, good heavens. He's, he's failing, your everybody. unique dynamic. D- Dan Bot is, is failing. Yeah. Dot exe. Um, your unique dynamic is one of the best I've heard in the podcast uh, I listen to and will hopefully fuel me through much needed revision over Easter and I might have caught up far enough to hear this by the end of Easter if you have ever read it that is uh, well Tommy K you've, here's a little treat for you um, <laughs> I discovered you Play it again Dan. I discovered you by <laughs> yeah. you're good kid real good but as long as I'm around you'll always be second best so. uh, I, deco- I discovered you via Simon's appearance on the Oxcast and relish in the nerdiness and random tangents of each episode a roller coaster of emotions and topics my oh. friends and I plan to start a podcast at some point based around us chatting shit and drinking tins uh, however none of us can get organised enough to uh, get anywhere near a start point yet hopefully living in a house together next year will give us the spark of life we need apologies for the slightly random dictions uh, directions uh, this <laughs> freud this went in and lack of writing ability like 
like I said, I'm a physics student. I do. I. Uh, <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I don't. I don't do words very good, and don't have it in me to proofread. This is one of my from favorite episodes. Reader, oh my god, Tommy K. Oh well, thank you, Tommy K. I can't read either, Tommy. It's fine. I feel like this episode has been everything you want. We've got the nerdiness. We've got the random tangents. That was quite a nice email. Dan's also been emulating your lack of writing ability by his lack of speaking. Um, also, I, 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 when you, you said Tommy K, I assume that was a joke name because that's how I refer to, to tomato ketchup, and I'm sure that Tommy K has heard that a million times. But um, <laughs> that's a, that's a great name. Well, I'm, I'm glad that you found us. Um, and I'm glad that you've enjoyed the show and hopefully you'll enjoy this new episode which is released nearly two months after you emailed this in <laughs> sorry sorry about the wait yeah. we've, we've been Dan's been busy alright well, I've been busy as well but Dan has been busy with his education and it's clearly had a great effect on him <laughs> yeah it's things have, we've had a really kind of unexpected uh, turnout oh god shall I pick a song hang on let's have a quick look um, uh, did you say a song yeah, so I was just looking. Should I pick a, a song? I was I was looking at an email that was about <laughs> yeah, if you want. song data. I mean, that's a different section, but it gave you life. <laughs> ah, now this is a great suggestion to round out the show. What I think is a great suggestion, something that you can do, Dan. Um, Adam Wrigley okay. writes in, "Dear Kermode and Mayo, would Kermode like the chewing gum?" Yes, exactly. Uh, yes, well done, Dan. Good, <laughs> have a biscuit. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> like the chewing gum. <laughs> This is one of my all-time favorite <laughs> episodes. <laughs> this is so ridiculous. Okay, I'm gonna I couldn't. Go. I couldn't stop myself. I... Oh god! Like like the chewing yeah, gum. <laughs> Uh, have have a have a a, a cat treat, um, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. dear Commode and Mayo, would Commode be able to make a playlist of his choral pieces of the week? As I feel the genre would be right up my alley. Naughty. Um, some of his recommendations nice. in such a list would be very useful. Cheers, Adam. Sure, like the chewing gum. Yeah, we should totally do that. Yeah, yeah. Put together a, a Spotify playlist of um, all the choral pieces of the week. Or, or do you have Spotify? Or are you just on Apple Music? I'm uh, exclusively available on Apple Music, Simon. Well, from our data, we do know that most people listen to the podcast via iOS. So we we do. This is true. So we, if you want to make an Apple playlist, if you if you do that, tell you what, you do that. Send me a link, and we'll put that in the show notes of every episode, so people can always have a look at it. Because um, yeah, I think bish, I, bash, bosh. I think a lot of people are interested in in the music side of things. So um, definitely. Uh, yeah, that, that'd be easy. I hear the kids love the music, Simon. Ah, uh, the, the kids. Yes, exactly. <laughs> right. What? Yes. Uh, sorry, no. We now need to finish off the episode before Dan literally has a brain aneurysm from uh, dehydration. Yeah, yeah. Oh my god! I just tried typing script, and it's so comically misspelled. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh yeah, that's the one I want. So, Simon, what have we learned today? Well, Daniel, I'm, I'm, I, as I'm sure you'll remember from the to- through your totally not hazy memory, um, we mm. learned today about the El Monte Berry Strike of 1933. Uh, which was between Mexican berry pickers and uh, Japanese landowners in uh, 1933 in California. Uh, and yeah. uh, there was, the outcome was a slight wage increase for the berry pickers um, and uh, a bunch of anti-communist propaganda stuff going on. And the uh, oh, the Kawaii, the uh, actually communist aligned workers union, uh, was basically disbanded afterwards because it was this was a heavy loss for the uh, the communist berry pickers of California. <laughs> I say, I can't take it seriously. I cannot take this this article seriously. There's something about it being about berries that just makes it so comically unimportant. But that that's what yeah. we learned. But what else did we talk about this episode, Dan? Simon, we spoke about so many things. We spoke about Game of Thrones, the finale, the finale. The, I think the, the finale. Yeah. Um, we uh, we spoke about Endgame. Uh, the MCU. We had a core piece yeah. of the week. Uh, where I recommended not just a piece, but also a newly discovered consort, the Marion consort, who are particularly fine. Mm-hmm. Uh, I recommended t- uh, Tenebrae as well, uh, on, on that note. Uh, yeah. uh, and and I, I also recommended that I think everybody should go and watch Chernobyl. Uh, it's 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 oh, yeah, that so really good. good. Like, please watch at least the first episode before next uh, the next podcast. Ideally, the first two. The first two episodes are really really strong. We had a very eventful Patreon corner where I managed to get. Uh, I we did. I made it through That's in true. one breath, and your brain just about started to the, the decline happened about then. <laughs> the yeah. Neurodegeneracy. Started the engine happening. started, which caused a complete failure of the of the, of the entire system. So I call you a bondulance. Um, are you going to? Are, are yeah. You, yes. I'm gonna. I'm having a strong. 
Um, and then we had some great correspondence. We introduced, uh, we had someone who I don't think was crazy at all, genuinely, in uh, Crisis no, Corner. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, to uh, well, some some fantastic, a very short but I think really good correspondence corner. So thank you. And if you'd like to email in, do do please do. Now we're back. Uh, you know, you can send us some yes, more stuff for sure. That's all for this week's episode. Don't forget to subscribe to us on your podcasting service of choice. You can like us on Facebook. And if you'd like to hear our face... Oh, f***. <laughs> if, you'd like, if you'd like to hear our faces, you, you can't, because that's not how it works. Let's let's try again, shall we? No, no, that's all staying in. And if you'd like to see our faces, check out our YouTube channel, Spongy and Electric. For now, like the chewing gum and other thoughts on the show can be sent to us at spongyelectric at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. Join us again for another tumble down the wiki rabbit hole, and And we'll we'll see see you you next time. time. You've been talking like a murloc this episode, you realise. What did you think of the Game of Thrones? (laughs) Final! Final. What was it you that you abbreviated earlier? What was it you said? I can't remember. Exact. (laughs) Exact. You knew what I meant. <laughs> yeah, exact. <laughs> we're back. Oh. Jesus Christ, I need God, I need I need to lie down. We're foldable. We're back.